So uh, I'm just going to start with a few simple questions. Uh, but first, we are uh, beginning our interview with uh, Mr. Jacques McKay. And um, the interviewer, as usual, will be William McCray. And uh, we are uh, located in Burlington at the moment. So for the first question, could you just please uh, state your full name? My full name? My real name? Your real name. You know, Jock is a nickname. That's not my real name, but everybody knows me by Jock. Okay. My real name is quite fancy, John. <laughs> <laughs> and the middle, my, my mother gave me a, a very nice middle name. She thought maybe I was going to open up a, a fancy store or something. It's Carlton with an E. So John Carlton McKay. John Carl, nice name. But I don't like it. I like being Jock McKay, which is the nickname my father gave me. Is that because John's too common, or? Uh, no, he had an uncle that he really liked, and okay. his name was Jock, and he died as a young man. I, I don't know how that affected my dad, but he wanted me to be a Jock. My mother wanted me to be a John. So, compromise. Uh, <laughs> she won unofficially, and he won with me. Right on. And what? Uh, what's your date of birth? February the 20th, this information uh, may be not very good. Well, let's say 1931. 1931? Yeah. Okay. So if I say, you know, the actual month and day, maybe that'd be, no, of course, it does appear on the internet or someplace, I guess. February the 27th, 1931. Here we are. Excellent. You got it out of me. Excellent. <laughs> and um, where were you born? In Rossland, British Columbia. British Columbia. And when I was born? They nicknamed, nicknamed me Sheriff. Sheriff. The little Sheriff. How so? Because my father was the local constable. And there's two constables in town. He was the senior constable for this, this massive city called Rossland. <laughs> <laughs> How many people? Oh, God, I don't know. Not very many back then. 1931? No. It'd be very small. As a kid, I wouldn't know. I left there when I was uh, four and a half years old. Okay, where'd you go to? We went to, oh, Dad was a policeman, so we, every few years we have to move. So we moved to Millardville, which is outside New Westminster. And uh, we stayed there about a year and a half, and then we moved to Penticton. We were there for almost five years, and then we moved to Cranbrook. There for several years, like four or five years, and then we moved to Taylor, British Columbia. Oh, and from there, I went to university in Vancouver, so. So as a child, what did, uh, although you moved a lot, what, what did you do for fun? What you, were your interests? Well, I presume you want my interests that relate to science. Uh, sure, but, but as a child, be honest, what, what did you do? And, and we'll, we'll get into, the, into your actual background. My favorite thing was mixing chemicals. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> like what? <laughs> Anything I get my hands on. My mother's uh, hand lotion, uh, the kitchen, uh, you know. Making potions and stuff. Making potions, <laughs> uh, vinegar, anything that would start bubbling. And then I, of course, learned that you put baking powder and, and uh, vinegar together. It got nice, interesting stuff. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So this is all done on sneaky. I didn't have to know I was uh, playing around with chemicals. But they must have known because um, I think it was in grade six, they, uh, they gave me a Christmas present, which was a chemistry set. I was ecstatic. I never had a better present in my life, you know, that chemistry set. It wasn't long before I was you know, making uh, gunpowder. <laughs> so gunpowder became a passion. I had the brains, though, uh, not to seal it. But I mainly made uh, containers of gunpowder with different things in it. Fireworks or, you know, okay. displays, pyrotechnic displays. And, uh, so you were not only a, a chemist, but a pyromaniac a little yeah, bit. Yeah. <laughs> The other thing I, I uh, liked doing was uh, observing ants and see what they did. And, uh, you know, things like watching aphids, milking their aphids. And then I wanted to see take ants and put them in with spiders in a jar and see who would win. The yeah. ants win. Yeah, the ants are strong. Poor old spider was scared stiff. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Strong animals. Yeah. Yeah. Any, uh, any colony animal, a insect, I find fascinating to yeah. watch. Yeah. Well, they're very clever, so I wanted to see what they're doing. And then uh, one of the teachers in high school let me um, come in on Saturdays with the one microscope we had. And uh, told me how to, how to use slides and so on and so on. 
and just entertain myself that way. Okay. Well, so already very uh, science oriented. Uh, very oriented. science oriented. Um, I think, uh, yeah. But you know, I played other games. So. Oh, yeah. High jumping was one of my sports. Oh yeah. Didn't like hockey because I didn't have the padding, and I got hit my shin with a with a puck, and uh, that, uh, that was it. This is not my game. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to have broken legs. Yeah, you know, we, we didn't have much money, so buying all the fancy gear kids have today is out of the question. Yeah, hockey's expensive, very expensive. Yeah. So your your father was a constable, and your and he, and he, he rose up finally to okay. the, um, staff sergeant. He was chief of police in trade. Okay, and did your uh, mother do anything, or was she at home? She was at home. Okay, yeah. so so really, the science was science was you. Yeah, it, it didn't yeah, come from. Uh, yeah, when, when I was in grade three, I heard of this scientist business. So, uh, oh, I thought that's what I want to be is you know discover things. And then I think about grade four, uh, I saw a movie with um, it was uh, uh, it was a cut. Oh, my brain thinks Edison. Oh, yeah, the world again. It was a movie of Edison, and uh, there was a problem there, and someone had needed an operation, and then all, all they had was these, these uh, gas lamps. And in fact, that was a, was a kerosene lamp, which gives up very little light. And as a kid, then I, you know, in grade four, I was showing, invent the electric light, invent the electric light. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, pretty simple-minded. Uh, and then in the grade six, I was worried about you know, I better grow up faster and memorize this stuff because nobody will know how to make electric lights. They won't be around. I mean, how will we, we get this information? You know, you know, very naive, but yeah. it, was, uh, it was stimulating. And then in high school, I think it was about grade 11, I had a very good teacher, chemistry teacher. And uh, I said to him, um, is there anything left to invent? It was a big, big deal. You know, yeah, for sure. Why go in to science? There's nothing left to do. So he drew a big box on the blackboard like this. And that's fine. He says, this is all there is to know. And then he took a little dot in the corner and says, that's what we know today. Said, wow, there's space for me. <laughs> I got a place to go. So that's uh, was very encouraging because I thought maybe they had invented everything. There's nothing more to know. So it's a bit, uh, he helped you kind of go into that He helped me uh, realize that, that it was, uh, you know, a dumb. I found it hard to believe that we knew so little when I thought we knew so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you went into sciences at, at Yeah, I went into UBC. UBC, I took engineering, metallurgical engineering. Why, me why specifically metallurgy? Why uh, not chemistry? <laughs> my brother was a mining engineer, and we were in the trail. And uh, he recommended go into metallurgical engineering. Now, mind you, very early on, um, Penticton, my parents also gave us a, a molding set where we could make lead soldiers, my brother and I. And so I had an interest in it. And then in grade seven, I had uh, manual training. And they had a forge in there. I was making knives, and, and also then I wanted to start making alloys. Uh, so instead of doing woodwork, I was busy in the forge, and nobody else was in the forge except me. So I had uh, predisposed towards metals and okay. chemistry. So metals and chemistry, it's called metallurgy. Yeah. So it, yeah. it goes together. So that was your bachelor's. Uh, were your, what were your, let's say your strong points or the classes you really liked versus the classes you disliked, if you did dislike any? Well, I, I liked um, uh, light, physics light. did very well in that. And I also like finance. Uh, for some reason, I yeah. got my two best marks well into the 90s. So that's probably why I liked it because I didn't Because you were good at them. <laughs> I didn't do well in, in civil engineering, which uh, I, 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 I don't know, I, I didn't like it. And so uh, I didn't do well. And I think the professor also had a very strange question. And I overthink the question. I put more into it than he intended. And so I got bogged down on, on, on the question. Sometimes it's the prof that makes or breaks the class. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, it, silly things to distract us, like a ladder, and uh, it has so many rungs, and the rungs are in the ladder, and it's glued. And I thought, well, I don't know the the values for that, the strength, and so on and so forth. His intent was to keep it simple, stupid. Yeah, kiss. And, and I <laughs> kiss, and I didn't know simple, stupid. I was trying to compute the strength of the glue and the, with that break and what strength, you know. So I didn't do very well. In it. My uh, my professor, uh, Bill Armstrong, went ballistic and he said, "No more metallurgists are going to your course when you give exams like that." And he, you know, I was his pet, so he didn't like his pet getting a low mark. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um... After your bachelor's, uh, what did you? Uh, I, uh, I got. Um, I had uh, my last year. I had appendicitis. I was in the hospital, and Bill Armstrong, Professor Armstrong, came to see me, and he threw a piece of paper on my chest. He says, "Sign this." I said, "What the hell is it, Bill?" He says, "The, the job with uh, Stelco." I said, "I don't know where where Stelco." He says, "It's a steel company in Canada. It's located in Hamilton, Ontario." Where's Hamilton? <laughs> you know, I didn't know. He said, well, never mind. The important thing is there's a, a genius in, in, in Stelco that started working there, and you should work with him and his research team. I said, great. So uh, I have a job, and uh, so I went to Stelco. <clears throat> Found it on the map, and so yeah. my wife, I was married in my last year of school. And, uh, so we look forward to it. We saw this big lake there, and we ended up swimming there. And oh boy, good place. Yeah, yeah. That's when kind of your memoir starts, where you arrive at Stelco. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a bit about uh, maybe, Stelco? I, I guess yeah. Even the first day and the fir the first period of your work at Stelco. Well, it sounds rather crazy. My first day at Stelco was was at the employment office, and they're letting people go. And so I went up to the counter and said, my name's Jock McKay. And immediately the manager came out and he says, you're Jock McKay? And I said, yeah. And he said, whoa, come on in. I went to his office. And Had he heard uh, your name from Irish? Yeah. I guess so. And then I got up treated. Um, there was a limousine to get me around town. They had already rented a place for me to stay until I got my own place. And uh, then the uh, metallurgist came and, and you know, works metallurgist. And uh, I asked him, you know, I thought, well, I'm going to have to be a laborer for a while. It's, you know, been my way up. And I said, well, what do you wear? And he says, what you wearing? A suit? You know, sports coat. He said, okay. Well, wow, this is different than I thought. Mm -hmm. So then I went uh, the next day to the metallurgical office. And uh, I met my, uh, this genius called George Sabaka. And this genius was, <laughs> he, I, I was introduced to him, and he uh, stood there, clicked his heels, bowed his head, and shot his hand out. I don't know, what is this, Nazism? <laughs> I mean, this guy must be a German, but I know he's a Russian. And so uh, that was my first introduction to, to the genius. So uh, then uh, in the first assignment, I couldn't understand what he was saying. Because he put his hand over his mouth like real. Uh, why? He put his hand over his mouth, right? He put his hand over his mouth. And I didn't know what he was saying. And also, he was speaking a thick accent. And in addition, we were in a room with next to um, a gas burn, a gas fireplace, a gas heated uh, ovens. And they make an awful noise. So I was in panic state because I didn't know what he asked me to do. <laughs> I hung around his office until I finally heard what he wanted. He was telling somebody else who was quieter in there, and he didn't have his hand over his mouth. Why, why did he speak like that? Well, he had rotten teeth. He had been a prisoner during the war. Uh, in, uh, uh, he, he was you know, in Ukraine, he'd been picked up from there. And because he spoke German, he was put on a farm to help uh, some German farmers, which was great for him. Yeah. That's an but there's no uh, way he's going to get his teeth fixed. So, uh, the end had, he hadn't been working in, in Stelco long enough to afford the, the cost of getting your teeth fixed. Oh. 
So that was the reason. And uh, and uh, now you, he was working for Stelco. Why was he known as the genius? What had he done so far that was? He was, he, was, he had a PhD in equipment yeah, from uh, Russia, and uh, he was an expert in thermodynamics. And I you know, I concur he was a genius that uh, I really enjoyed working for him. He could be a, a very painful man. <laughs> Uh, I became very close to him like a father, and the day, um, the day before he died, I went to visit him, and he held my hand, he said, Jock, and his wife told me at the funeral that that's the last word he said on earth, was my name. Wow. So we were close, even though I could punch him in the nose sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's often how it goes with the friends yeah. and coworkers. Yeah. <laughs> So, so when you started with them, what was your uh, position? Yeah, very, 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 very junior engineer, I was told. Okay. For, for R&D? Uh, or... No, it was called uh, De Development and Special Duties. Okay. Uh, de I think we called the department, actually. And that uh, word research was uh, a dirty word in Stoko. Nobody, but nobody could use that word. How so? Damn well, I know it was just a dirty word that they were proud of their uh, blacksmith approach, trial and error approach. Okay. To, uh, kind of more of a yeah. blue collar yeah, very, terminology. Very, very blue collar. Yeah. Okay. And fine with me. I'd worked in smelters and I could I could square up with the best of them. <laughs> I'd <have> no trouble. <laughs> Don't mess with me because I know all the words. <laughs> then so. So uh, I, I, I used to work in a lumber yard, actually. So, so, you know so I, I learned some, some yeah. slang, too. <laughs> um, so what was um, your first considerable or great project that you, that you worked on? I, uh, I saw several little ones to begin with, and then I landed a, a dandy. Um, I was brought into the office of the uh, chief metallurgist for the works, or works metallurgist. <coughs> and... George was there too, George Sabakin. And they uh, said, there's a new uh, unit that's coming on the world scene. DeFasco had one, which was continuous needing. This is where they take you know, thin strip, much like the thickness of containers, cans, you know, we call tin plate, but it's a, a steel strip. And it, when it's rolled down into thin, these thin sheets, it becomes very hard and brittle. And so you have to anneal it. And the way they annealed it was put it in a big uh, roll like this, stack several rolls on top, and put it into an oven and leave it there for a couple of days. Now, continuous ending, a little different. So that big roll is still there, put it on the end of um, on a, on a um, what do they call it? Doesn't matter. They peel off the strip at high speed going three or four, five hundred feet uh, uh, a minute into a, a chamber with uh, heating and then cooling and then it's wrapped up on the other end. And so uh, it's done very, very rapidly. Every piece of steel sees the same uh, temperature regime. And uh, so that whatever regime you have in there, that's what you're going to get at the end. Only problem is nobody knew what was the shortest cycle you could use. Because now we're facing a situation instead of days, we're facing a few seconds. Wow. So the heating is you know, up to temperature, which is, say, 1250 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, seven seconds to get there. And then how do you long do you hold it at 1250? And you know, is it a minute or is it two minutes or what is it? Well, I had to do, I had, first of all, I didn't know how the hell I was going to measure the temperature strip. I knew that U.S. Steel was building a, a pilot unit to, to find the shortest cycle so, because it's very expensive. Um, these buildings, are, you know, they're three stories high, they're half a block long sort of thing. Is that how, how long the trajectory it has well, you're to be? you're going at high speed. Now they, you know, they go over a thousand feet a second, or a minute, I should say. And uh, wow. so even 25 seconds takes up a lot of space. Yeah. Now, 
So I, I am, long story short, I found a way of measuring the precise temperature of coupons. And then from that, I deducted by heating and cooling at different rates and so on, the exact thermal cycle, which turned out to be 25 seconds over 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the cooling rate was a surprising 25 seconds down to 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And after that, it didn't matter how, how fast or how slow it cooled. <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not going to get into the detail because <laughs> it, no one will understand me. <laughs> but it, that, um, uh, that then they built the, the unit based on my cycle. And I, had, uh, I was asked to do the calculations for the, the heat up, which I did, which uh, Stefan Boltzmann's law and so on. So it would be easy to do with a computer, but I had to use a, a Marshall and calculator. And this went, uh, this was very tedious. Trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. And then when I got the, the, the heat input and the heat output match, I knew I had the right temperature. And then I go next step, next step, next step. So that uh, finally I gave the, the computations to the designer and he was happy because then he knew exactly what was happening and could design from that, including when there was the cooling stage, that little calculation. Mm -hmm. So the day it started up, there was a big gang of uh, you know, brass there and a little old me. And they started up, and I set the cycle and uh, said, okay, take a test coupon, and took a test coupon. And it was right smack on what I said it would be. And I felt pretty good. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and about uh, half an hour later, I was the only one standing there. They said, this, we've never seen a startup like this. And so I was thrilled, you know, as a young fellow. So quite pleased. And then the next, um, what happened, is they wanted to publish a paper. And so I wrote the paper. And uh, <clears throat> the chief metallurgist, that is not only just in charge of metallurgy in, in his works, uh, uh, but all the other works that Stelco had. And he had his name in the paper, not mine. But I, uh, I put an, an acknowledgement to myself in the back of the paper. Okay. <laughs> I didn't mind because uh, that, was a, that was the standard procedure. It was obvious to everybody in the company and probably elsewhere that there's no way he could do all that research. I mean, <laughs> three years of, of cheating, not, mm -hmm. not a chance. So he had a big plaque behind his desk and he was very proud of it. I remember he had a uh, chap, director of research from BHP, Australia, big company, came and he wanted to talk with a med, uh, an Eden. And of course, Huggy Mori, who was the chief member, just hadn't got a clue. Yeah, there's you. <laughs> That's what he talking. called me in and uh, answered all his questions. And I looked at the plaque up there and I thought, you know, he takes a lot of, uh, I don't know what, uh, indifference or gall or something to not tell this fellow that uh, yeah. the guy that <laughs> did all the work and wrote the, the report is sitting right here. But I think he guessed because I was answering all the questions. Okay. So. Well, it must have paid off with him, Stelco, though. Well, yeah. I was well aware of that. It, 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 yeah. 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 And and from there, did you, uh, what were the other positions? Was Because that was still when you were a junior. I was junior, yeah, yeah. So afterwards, and Stelco. I was Stelco. junior for uh, not very long, about one year, and, and George Sabaka says, you, you want to be my assistant? He said, I have no objection. And a whole bunch of um, young technologists came in from Ryerson, I think, and places like that. And they were in the same, I, I created another office called D Office, my boss is in the E Office. And I found a place where I could st stack all these people in <clears throat> one, the, one of the buildings that wasn't being used. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, they were busy doing nothing. So I said, I hadn't really exercised my position and, and hadn't been formally announced. So I just asked them, would you fellas like to work for me? And they, yeah, they would. So I put them all to work and <laughs> signed them jobs and what have you. And that's how I started. And eventually, and I think my five years in, uh, well, prior to that, the, the 
Wurzmiller just said, uh, we can't give you a title. I said, why? He said, well, it'd be uh, unseemly to rise so fast in the organization. It's not done. I said, okay, I have no problem. Just increase my pay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But after five years, the uh, we had been so successful at a number of things that the president, who actually the, the vice president of operations, was very keen to uh, have a research group. So he decided on having a research group. So they did, now they had the word research. They have now the word research, research and development. It's no longer dirty because we had uh, the work we've done in the blast furnace had double the output and uh, lowered the amount of coke consumption by 15%. But this is staggering. Uh, it may not seem staggering to you, but we started on a furnace, a very tiny furnace. Fortunately, we had a small old furnace that was about to be destroyed. It only produced um, 600 tons a day. I went to the superintendent of that, uh, well, of all the blast furnaces, and uh, we told him what we wanted to do. And he said, well, what do you think you're going to get out of it doing that? I said, well, I think we'd get over a thousand tons a day. And he started laughing. <laughs> he called and he called the assistant superintendent and says, come on in here, listen to these, these long-haired bastards. Well, my boss had practically bald, little, he kept his hair cut short, and I had a, a, a practically a crew cut. So they were long, long haired bastards, but I guess it was a flattery because it was referred to Einstein. Okay. And I, I had to put the two and two together. But, um, uh, we, we went ahead and, yeah, we uh, practically doubled the output. And then the, uh, the president of the company didn't believe it. He had been uh, superintendent of the blast furnaces at one time in his life. And so he had the accounting department go check it day after day after day. And then he finally was yeah, convinced we had <laughs> done the impossible. How had, you, how had you changed it? We had changed the, the, the nature of the beast to, we had uh, made it more permeable. He uh, taken out all the little fines. Uh, we had changed the composition of the, of the input, which we called self-flux center. So there was no need for fluxing stone. It was fluxed in the ore itself, and it was pre-calcined. So there was no work that necessary in the furnace. And then eventually uh, we, uh, we did a number of other things to increase the permeability so the gas, the, the carbon monoxide rising up the stack, um, permeated through all the ore, whereas if you, usually they had channeling and they would just go up and fish on the sides or, or maybe okay. just channeling on the sides. You never knew where it was. It was a lot more channel. uniform. So it was more uniform and more efficient. So they greatly increased the efficiency of the unit. Okay. That's in brief. If you want in detail. <laughs> um, uh, would you say uh, George, uh, his second name, George? His actual name is Yaroslav. Yaroslav. When he arrived in Canada, he said uh, Yaroslav. And the, the, the immigration guy said, okay, George. <laughs> so his name is George. Okay. Yeah. So would you say uh, Yaroslav was your greatest mentor? Yes. In your life? Yeah. Definitely. And um, out of your entire career at Stoko, uh, was there ever, I guess, a, a job or a project you worked on that you could say was dysfunctional? <laughs> Cut. I'm not talking about anything that's dysfunctional. No? no. All right. <laughs> um, okay, then maybe... Because uh, I'll be talking for hours. For hours? Yeah. <laughs> I will not talk do you, about it. Do you have like one specific... Uh, no. Okay. What about uh, some challenges? What's one very challenging job that you had to do? They're all challenging. More than others? Is there one Being that stands a bloody out? director of research and development okay. is very challenging, yeah. But it's not the one I liked. I like doing research, not being the director of research. Because it didn't, uh, I often had to do things that had nothing to do with research. It was called in to, to be in this committee or that committee. That, you know, was, uh, one that really was annoying was the salary 
evaluation committee. And I, I knew I had it served five years on it, so I suffered that. Because there's you know, there's no researchers. I did some Yeah, yeah you were more in the administrative. Yeah, I got yeah. administrative and the five years was up. I had about a six month repeat when they said, You gotta go back again for another five years. I said, No one ever goes back for for two stints. They said, Well you do because you're representing all the technical people, the engineering department, the metallurgical department, and all the other subsidiary ones like environmental um, to look after them. And you know them all, and nobody else does. Um, but yeah, I, I have a wide range of knowledge. And I was well liked by the um, salary department. So I've stuck with it. For a second term. Yeah, and then uh, when that was over, the boss said, uh, "I want you to return." <laughs> I got, I got the vitriolic. <laughs> but uh, after I blew my stack, uh, I went back. All right, really? Okay, good. How so? Why? Why? Uh, if if it if there's so much of that job that wasn't T just it was um, that wasn't the science. It wasn't science. So why why uh, why go back? Because you're told to go back. I'm an employee, after all. Okay, that's right. Director of research is still an employee. So is the president an employee. Yeah. So you did a good job and they wanted you back every yeah. time and yeah. you kind of had they to say yes. They were comfortable with me. Okay. So I, I guess that was it. I don't I never okay. asked. But you didn't, you, you never uh, thought to, there was an option to say no. I got it. Very to see the impression there was okay. I had no yeah. options. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I don't think they would have fired me, but uh, certainly be displeased that they didn't <laughs> was asked to do it. Yeah. Because after all, it was only once every uh, for half an hour or half a day or a full day a month. Okay. But I resented the loss of the day. Yeah. I had a lot of work to do. Yeah, so, I, I believe it. I don't want that. It had, an, uh, it had a spin-off advantage, though, because it was a, a group from across the company, all senior people. And so I got to know them on a month one basis, even to a point where I, you know, I told one uh, general manager that uh, he, he ticked me off so much. I said, look, I'm going to put your feet in concrete and <laughs> dump you into the lake. And I really meant it. Uh, that we, they started laughing. They all started laughing. <laughs> that I had blown my top. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that same day, we were good friends. Yeah. It was just that moment of irritation. It happens. It happens. Yeah. Um, what, what would you say uh, would be your fondest memory uh, professionally? Is there a specific... Uh... I think that one I did tell you about, the first one, because it's like, uh, you know, continuous innings. Like, okay, yes. Um, it was I your think first because big, yeah. uh, I wouldn't have said that to you, except in doing my memoir, it dawned on me that uh, that was um, a very the kid that did it, a young man, mm -hmm. the origin younger. I was only in my early twenties. Uh, had done a fantastic job, and and uh, how he knew all the research steps to take to make sure data was accurate uh, impressed me as a. As a and director of research. <laughs> Had I known him, I would have hired him and, and, and promoted him uh, because he was doing it all right with, with makeshift equipment. Somehow he overcame all the problems. Now I know how he did it, but uh, I'm impressed that he had the, the intuition. He was, hadn't had the training in research, but he had the intuition mm -hmm. of what to do to overcome problems of variability in data. And uh, I did everything, that, and I would still do the same way, to overcome the fluctuation in data that uh, you're going to get. Very, very careful about that. So I'm, I'm impressed with that guy, and so I said, very well done. And also, um, when the paper was published, it won the best paper of work. And uh, it, I saw it subsequently translated into Japanese and Russian, maybe oh, yeah. into other languages, but I saw those two. And, uh, that was the same paper, where, same paper where you were acknowledged. Yes, yes. Way back. <laughs> <laughs> very circumspect. 
<clears throat> so did the metallurgists have to present the paper? The uh, chief uh, metallurgist yeah, presented the paper. Worked. Yeah, I wasn't allowed to go with the American Iron Steel Institute. It's all the, the mucky mucks from across North America mm -hmm. that uh, go there. And if you aren't mucky muck, then uh, <laughs> you can't go. And being a very, very junior engineer, there's no way that they could allow him to go. No. <laughs> Um, throughout your career, did you join any professional organizations? And yeah, so, which were they? Yeah. A little too many. A little too thing. many? Yeah, too many. I need a, a piece of paper there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Let's see. Those are my awards. Those are my positions. External committees, government committees, universities. Business of honor, industry links. Somebody's in there. Box, agreements, civic and personal activities, continuing education courses, education, teaching. Okay. American Society for Metals, the CIM. A I M E. That one, I the scope put me on that and paid my paid the fee, which was kind of nice. Uh, I don't know. What's a. Uh, what difference does it make? So there's a lot. What's a. Uh, okay, okay, let's take the CIM. What, what was your role in the CIM? Just a member. Okay. And uh, there was METSOC, Metallurgical Society. Uh, I, they, Made me a life an honorary life member. That, uh, so, well, oh, and I won an award from CIM, the area award. The which one? Area award. On uh, what? What grounds? What? Uh... Oh, because I, I, I combed my hair the right way. Mr. McKay received this honor in the Metallurgical Society of the Canadian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy annual conference banquet in Winnipeg, Manitoba, August twenty fifth. 1987, in recognition of his significant contributions to the promotion and advancement of ferrous metallurgy research, both at the corporate and national levels. There you go. There you go. Yep. I don't know who wrote that. <laughs> and um, throughout your career, what social activities were you involved in? What what uh, what was the go-to thing to do? Well, running a, a department, and we had social. Social secretary that you know, to, to build teamwork. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of different things, dances and the parties. And, you know, often involved the kids' Christmas party for the kids. Mm -hmm. you know, so, and then we'd bring in um, uh, kids from, from you know, that don't have parents, from foster homes or what have Orphans. So, so orphans. It's nice. Yeah, the. Um, more and more people I talk to um, in, in either the mining, metallurgy, in, in those um, do domains, they seem to work really hard at um, at building the community within uh, within that company or within that uh, that trade. It seems very very close. I guess because a lot of them can quite often be isolated as well. So, well, I wanted the uh, my staff to feel that they're there. Working together as a mm -hmm. team, but I also uh, did something rather unusual. I don't know if any other director has done it. Uh, I'd give every mm, six weeks, call the department together for an hour on Friday afternoon, the last sort of hour of the day, because I knew they were doing buzz all anyway, <laughs> and uh, fill them in on the company. I had access to an awful lot more information than most superintendents do. Because of my level and my, my location, and my, well, I, I had access to everything. So I, I don't believe in I believe in transparency, mm -hmm. and uh, even though a lot of it there was of no value to them whatsoever, it did not make them feel they were no longer a number, and make them feel that we're working for a large corporation and that the corporation is moving in this direction or that direction. So I'd give them uh, tell them what's on the order books and. You know, cash flow and gave them all kinds of stuff that 
it just flew over their head, but still. Yeah, at least they were, they and were they, in the loop. You know, they uh, made sure that there was free coffee and donuts, and, and there was no obligation to attend. Okay. You don't have to attend. It's only if you want to attend. I got pretty well full house. <laughs> Friday afternoon, why not? Yeah, why not? Coffee, you know, donuts. coffee and <laughs> three donuts. Gosh, I think that's what they came for. for but sure. no, they did a lot of laughing because I didn't keep it. I kept it late at times too so, and allowed them to comment. So there's a lot of interaction. So they end up calling it, I didn't call it, they call it Jock Talks. Jock Talks. <laughs> it's catchy. It's catchy. Yeah, I had a very large screen behind me so I also could project data. And I had a microphone so that everyone in the back row could hear. Um, and out, outside of work completely, did you have any, uh, or time for any other pastimes or social activities? Not really. No, 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 no hobbies outside of work? Not until, uh, well, yeah, I ended up uh, doing very, uh, you know, <laughs> again, like research. I did genealogy. Mm. And back then it was not as easy it is today. No kidding. There was no computers, so I had to actually do the research and go to the different archives, like in Ottawa, to you know, find the information. But again, it appealed to me. You see, I was doing administration, but the genealogy allowed me to do research, and so I was I was happy. Yeah. And uh, anytime I can pull things together, sort them out, I like doing my videos. I'm doing now, it gives me pleasure. I, I'm a nutcase. <laughs> <laughs> you always have to have something on the on the go. It has to be technical. Uh, mm -hmm. It has to be uh, uh, searching. I remember uh, uh, we were down at Myrtle Beach, and I was happy in the pool. And a big book I was reading. There was a guy sitting beside me. I didn't know who he was, and he said, "Oh my God, what are you reading that for?" I said, "Because I enjoy it." It was a textbook on DOS, <laughs> disk operating Oof. system. Ah. Oh, I enjoyed it. I'm with him on that. <laughs> <laughs> he thought it was a nutcase. Uh, and I didn't see it that way. I'd always been reading technical, and I still do. Yeah. Well, it keeps your. Uh, yeah. I can't help it. Keeps your brain away. Wired for sure. Way. Yeah. Um. And this. I was called a walking encyclopedia. One. A walking encyclopedia. Yes. Yeah. Not a bad thing. No. I don't know. It was meant as an insult. It, I yeah, it has a compliment. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, it called a lot of other things too that were not quite <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, you can imagine. <laughs> well, as the boss, I mean, you're bound to. You're bound to be called something. Um, this this is a question, I guess, that spans your entire career and and have has changed I assume mm. uh, but how present and or absent uh, were women in the workplace and what were, were their roles they were then and now? were absent in the beginning other than secretarial staff. Um, it wasn't until some time that, that women started going into engineering and then actually wanting to put it in practice like going into research. And I finally uh, I got um, Olga Delvecchio, very bright she was the top of her class in Windsor, and uh, I was thrilled at getting some of that brilliant. And I had to take a husband too. He was a good guy, but not at her level of, of intelligence. But first, it was very astonishing um, to have a woman speak our language, uh, Midland. It was almost like a, our personal language. I thought, thought it was an affront, but she could come in and into our domain and talk our language. Oh. My goodness, and then I got used to it. And uh, I'm happy to say I promoted her up to high level. And now she's, um, she's in, uh, I brought her into statistics um, that uh, she has excelled at it. She was really in, 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 uh, in uh, stress and strain of, of metals, but. Uh, I could see it in her that it was a better fit with statistics, and I needed someone to teach my staff statistics. And she ended up uh, creating a little department of her own, which was in the, the quality control for the company. 
and now she's she soon became sort of like an expert, and she you know, gets jobs all over yeah. the world at a very high pay, and she's still still working. Have you uh, have you traveled a lot with uh, with work? Oh my God, yes. Yeah, one of my around the world. Yeah, yeah. You name it. I mean, what's your well? What's what's one of your most memorable trips or areas? I liked um, South Africa. I'm not the first to say that. Quite a few have mentioned South Africa. Yeah, and uh, Pretoria was very nice. The time of year, the one first or second time I was there, uh, the jacaranda trees were in blossom and the petals were coming down on the sidewalk and I was walking through these petals, the purple petals. Very, very nice. And then uh, I didn't want to go, but the, uh, the in Colm Cousin, at the head of uh, Isco, Iron and Steel Company of, of a uh, corporation, and uh, wanted me to go to uh, Cougar Park. And this is a huge park, uh, hundreds of miles long, and up against Mozambique. Uh, I went there, and uh, we were in various camps. So we went from one camp to another. Each day we went to a different camp. And you were locked into the camp until 6 a.m. in the morning. And then you have to get back to the camp at 6 p.m. at night, because uh, otherwise you get locked out. So you can't get out, and you can't get in uh, if you uh, go over the curfew. But why, why were they locked so The animals uh, are okay. free, and you are in the cage. Ouch. Lions, you know, yeah. tigers, elephants, you name it. Uh, a lot of beautiful animals. It was, it was, I was so impressed. I had not expect, I thought, you know, all like a zoo or something, I, you know, no interest. I'll do it because they want me to do it, and uh, I thank them for forcing me into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Four days in uh, Cougar Park, I'll never forget it. Huh. So if you're having any holidays, go there. Yeah, yeah, I've, yeah. No, I've heard a lot of amazing things about uh, South Africa. But I saw a lot of uh, great countries, particularly in Japan. I want to go to Japan as well. <clears throat> yeah, in Kyoto. Mm -hmm. um, but I had the advantage of a big corporation in Japan looking after me. So I had an interpreter, I had a guide, and I went to places that you want to get into. And, uh, I was. Yeah. But uh, the steel companies in Japan at the time uh, really threw me because they were so far advanced. They were way ahead of you know, where Stucco was, and way ahead of where the Fasco was, and so on. We, we were just like dumbbells compared to their operations. Okay. I, I had heard, uh, I was speaking with Mr. Uh, Jerry Heffernan. Oh, Jerry, yeah. He's still alive? Yeah, 95. 95. Uh, I saw him yesterday. I like Jerry very much. Right? Yeah. yeah, nice guy. And he was telling me uh, about uh, his relationship with uh, many Japanese companies back in the day, yeah. steel making. And you're saying a lot of, uh, on a lot of grounds, they were more advanced than uh, in North America. Yes. Yeah. No question about it. Yeah. I saw some backward countries too, but uh, Japan was certainly up there. They had been uh, ridiculed by, I was at a meeting of um, American directors of research, and they were mocking the Japanese for coming over and, and they look at their plants and <clears throat> have a bunch of people that have cameras and one thing they thought was very, very funny. I didn't because I'd already been aware of, of uh, the excellence of some of the work coming out of Japan. But uh, these guys uh, are, they can't be directors of research. They're obviously not reading the international literature. They're probably reading their own papers. You don't yeah. learn anything from reading your own papers. Have to look around the world yeah. and be aware of what your competition is doing. And certainly, Japan is a big competition. Um, could you tell me a bit about uh, your work as co founder and former director at the Canadian Steel Industry Research Association? Oh, you, you picked that up from my memoir? You wouldn't have. Where no. Did you get no. that information from? 
I think that was uh, CIN helped me out with oh, that. Oh, okay. The guys from that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, um, the universities in Canada had some excellent people uh, to do research, and I felt it was a waste of resource because there was no uh, interaction between the steel industry and the universities other than what I did, which I thought, no, it should be the whole whole industry. We are in competition, I guess, with each other, but perhaps even more with like Japan and Germany and, and any place that had higher technology. And so I thought these brains should be put into work. And so we formed the, the uh, Syrup Canadian Institute of uh, Research. I forget the association. You got it written down there? Yeah, Canadian Steel Industry Research Association. Yep, yep. <laughs> Anyway, I, they, uh, they won me as uh, the president of it, and I tried to get him after five years, and now they want me to stay again. Just so like, yes, just the like same yeah. bloody thing, but finally, I, I absolutely insisted, so, so I got out of it. So, so, um, the but it was, it was, we would go, I'd phone mm -hmm. up a university and say, you know, may we come uh, and uh, for a visit. Who we'll give a talk and uh, we expect you to give us a talk, show us around, see what research you're doing, we'll tell you, and try and make an interaction. And uh, at one stage, uh, I was very keen on promoting uh, Cheers. I had already uh, approved the Cheer at uh, McMaster, and uh, one at UBC. Uh, McMaster was done before me, but I, I had to keep approving it every single year. And the one at UBC, I created that. Uh, and then the, um, I wanted the zero to create another. And they, we did, they did a search and they came up with the name John Jones, whom I didn't know. And so uh, when they said, oh, okay, and they called the president of steel companies, how much they have to uh, get, uh, hand in <coughs> to, uh, to make it impossible. I went to see John Jonas, and I'm most impressed with him. And uh, John was working on the metal, uh, metallurgy of a balloon. I said, well, John, <laughs> this, this chair uh, is for steel. The steel industry is paying him. I think it would be proven if we switch over to steel. And bless him, he did. He moved over to steel, and he did some outstanding research. Really smart guy. Great respect. Did it? Uh, did the? Did Sira also? Did it work at um, pushing students towards those uh, jobs, or like was, maybe yes. co-ops and stuff like that? Or well, the idea was that uh, we would have access to the professors, and the professors okay. could you know, assess us and decide whether they're going to encourage their, their students to go to the steel industry or go to the aluminum industry or go okay. Wherever. And and would you and would you guys often offer uh, maybe like summer positions or yes. or uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. or after their their I bachelors? Seen, uh, one year I took about ten. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and give them a taste of doing research. It'd be simple stuff, nothing difficult. Yeah. Because you're not going to be there long enough to complete a good program. Mm -hmm. Good program, nonetheless. Gets gets you uh, learning exactly yeah. what you what you like and. We even, uh, we even arranged for a group of Canadian professors to go over to Europe together uh, where we didn't join them. And they came back and they told me, you know, um, that they, you know French Canadians and English Canadians um, found that they were closer together in attitude and approach than any of their counterparts in Europe. Oh, yeah? You know, we think the, the one guy had been born in Belgium. Ecole Polytechnique, and he said, no, Jack, he said, I'm closer to the guys, you know, to McMaster and UBC than I am with anybody in Belgium. Huh? So we just, he didn't know that, didn't know how close we were and how we thought the same way and yeah. behaved in a certain manner. We have a, have more than a veneer of Canadian in us, and you probably have too, you don't know. I like to think so. I didn't know it <laughs> until I found out going around the world the other I believe it. We're, uh, we're different. Yeah. But it's hard to put your finger on what it is. Yeah, well, especially with the Canadian identity. It's so, uh, that's our identity is that we're so different. And 
open and multicultural. Yeah, it's, yeah. very different. Um, if this might be a tough question, and maybe it's the one you answered a while ago, but what will be the proudest moments of your life? My children, of course. <laughs> good, good answer. Good answer. I uh, got five children. Five, yeah. They're very successful. So I'm very proud of them. Good answer. And that's uh, my proudest. I think that's my only real achievement in my life. <laughs> that's the, the five kids. Okay. And uh, professionally? What will be your proudest moment? Is it the? Uh, is it your first big project? Oh, that big project. Yeah. The others, there was many others that you know. The, the blast furnace one, I, I won the award on that as well. Not again, not in my name. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, got one that was in my name uh, for the blast furnace work. The Robert Hunt Silver Award. I was first Canadian ever to receive them, so I felt that good. But I, you know, I don't have this. My heart's not in that one as much as it was with convenience and evening. No. Well, it's like your first kiss for yeah. goodness sakes. Yeah. Yeah. Everything subsequent to that. Yeah, it's not as special. Well, especially as a director, you direct, and you're not there at the bench, mm -hmm. and so you you lose. You get several degrees away from from the actual research, which I found irritating. It took me five years to get used to the concept that I wasn't to do research, I was to, to, to lead it, direct yeah. it, and do the administration. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is probably my favorite question. If you were to uh, speak to someone much younger, like me or a student, uh, what would sh what, what's the most important piece of advice or um, life lesson you could give them? Life lesson is to always study, never give up, because the world is changing. You can can't um, be in research unless you study routine, take courses, and self-train. Read textbooks, read you know, articles, the latest articles that come out in magazines. <clears throat> Otherwise, in seven years, you'll be obsolete. Yeah, especially with the technology you're now. Be, you're going to be obsolete. You cannot afford to be obsolete. So I'll keep on doing it. That includes the director. He's got to keep. <laughs> he's really got to. He's got to keep reading DOS. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was private. That's amusement. Yeah. <laughs> well, to some people. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add or or share with me? No, I, I, well, I'm sad at the the handling of the steel industry mm -hmm. in Canada. Part of the blame I can, you know, on the individuals, but also on, on the Canadian government, <clears throat> because uh, there should have been an amalgamation of Stelco and Defasco and some of the others, but that was always blocked. But we uh, we uh, couldn't amalgamate, and bigger and better in the steel industry. They've had Defasco and Stelco being uh, able to join. Not that they maybe would have, because the one had a union, one didn't have a union. That uh, it, it would be a better, healthier company. Yeah. Still very strong. But Defasco is a very good company. But you know, it's no longer in the hands of Canadians. Yeah. Because yeah. the company that bought them had bought other companies and it's expanded. And many, many of the steel companies are Canadian companies are. And you have to be no longer ruthless, and you have to be right on top of uh, the techniques that give you the lowest cost and the best quality. Uh, yeah, and if you're going into engineering, uh, remember the difference between an engineer and any other scientist is the dollar sign. So you better understand dollars and cents, you know, discounted cash flow and, and future value and all that sort of thing. So that, that may be part of your vocabulary so that you can make good choices, financial choices between two or three projects, which which one do you do? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's not what most engineers are told, but I would tell them that. Yeah, that's where you're good at. That's you why you're good at finance. Economics and finance. Yeah. <laughs> or you're you're not not going to do the right thing. You'll do a project that is not financially you know, worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Spend a lot of money spinning wheels.
Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Much appreciated.